Hello everybody, good afternoon. Uh, it's Judith Lip here uh, at the Trek office in Toronto. Thank you for joining us for the Power of Community webinar. Uh, this is uh, an opportunity for us to share a recent report that uh, an economic analysis that we conducted to understand better understand the impact that community-owned renewable energy is having uh, in, in the province of Ontario. And uh, just before we get started, I've, I want to just introduce a few people and uh, also, just go through a couple of uh, protocol issues around just using the webinar. So, uh, with me is Daria Taran, who has been working with Trek and the People Power Planet Project. He's going to go through a couple of house, housekeeping details. And then the other presenter today is Brett Dolter, um, who is going to talk about the economic analysis and uh, I'll give a more fulsome introduction um, when he's up. So, uh, just to start a couple of. Whoops, one second. Um, just a couple of uh, issues related to navigating the, the go-to webinar. Daria? Hello everyone. So um, if you have not uh, used the go-to webinar program before, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, so as, as you probably have noticed, you will begin the webinar muted. And please keep it that way unless you're speaking in a discussion period. And I can actually go ahead and unmute you uh, myself. Um, so you don't you don't have to worry about that either. Uh, and please use the questions tab. You're going to notice a questions tab, and please use it only for uh, only for technical issues. And please use the chat tab for discussion related questions and comments only. So if you want to ask something about the presentation uh, and uh, about something that relates to the research that we're presenting, please use the chat tab and use the questions tab only for technical issues such as I can't hear you, I can't see my screen, or I can't unmute myself. Um, and if you have a question, this is of course uh, going to be how you're going to be uh, telling us you, you want to ask a question in the discussion period, but even before that, please raise your hand. You will notice a little hand on the left hand side of your control panel. Uh, please press that, this way we know that uh, you either want to ask a question or you want to make a comment. So this is going to be especially helpful during the discussion period. And again, if you have any questions regarding what I just talked about, please use the questions tab. Uh, and thank you very much. And I'm passing it back to Judy. All right, great. Thanks, Daria. So uh, yeah, welcome everybody. I we've got a really uh, great uh, number of people that have registered from all across the country, actually. So that's very exciting. And as far away as Australia and Turkey and uh, where else? In the UK. Oh, in the UK, well. yeah. So uh, we're really excited that there's so much interest in this, uh, in the work that we've been doing and in community power in general, of course. So just uh, just to give you a sense of how, the, um, how our time together will work. Uh, so I'm going to present first, I'm going to talk a little bit about who TREC is and the Federation of Community Power Co-ops that also gets referenced in the report. I'm going to give some context for the report itself and why we uh, decided to undertake it uh, and, and really sort of looking in at what's happening with energy, uh, energy policy in Ontario. I'm going to talk a little bit about community power and what that means and then the benefits of community power, but I'm, I'm not going to focus on the economic benefits. I'm going to leave that to Brett's uh, economic analysis. Then I'm going to share some poll questions that we um, undertook here in Ontario um, to understand, you know, people's attitude towards community power. Uh, and then a few policy recommendations that we're sharing with the uh, Ontario government uh, going forward. And then I'll hand it over to Brett to talk about the economic analysis and a short presentation on the methodology for those of you who might be interested in you know how that uh, how those numbers were derived, uh, and then we'll have time for question and answer, uh, and any kind of discussion that people would like to have. So um, I'm assuming everything's good, no technical issues. So um, yeah, I will go through a couple of slides here. So first of all, just wanted to introduce you all to Trek. Um, formerly stood for Toronto Renewable Energy Cooperative. We've been around uh, since 1998 and certainly were focused in Toronto uh, initially, but now work very much across Ontario and in different parts of the country to promote 
community ownership of renewable energy. Um, and uh, we've been really been a leader in that by building first community owned wind project and uh, called Windshare. See that in the picture on the right. And then on the left is SolarShare, uh, Canada's, one of Canada's largest solar co-ops. Um, so we work a lot with the cooperative sector, but we've also been working with indigenous communities and, uh, and social enterprises in terms of project development and community member and investment services. What that means is we help uh, groups that are managing uh, community finance and community investments um, to yeah to help uh, find efficiencies and uh, and to keep their money secure. And we also inform policy through our research and advocacy efforts. So, uh, and that's really you know this report is really about that. It's it's about better understanding the work that we do. But better uh, and also about promoting community power and you can see there our vision um, so you know we believe that people working together can get more done and if we pool our resources to uh, realize a low carbon economy we will you know we will all benefit from it uh, mutually and uh, and have a more democratic system going forward so that's a little bit about TREC uh, and then the Federation of Community Power Co-ops is an organization that uh, uh, co not the renewable energy co-op sector in Ontario uh, formed together in 2012 uh, as, a, as a sort of network for sharing resources and experiences, but also to create a common voice when it comes to uh, policy goals and objectives. And you can see again, some pictures of our members down below. Um, on the far right there, we have a picture of Premier Wynne visiting uh, the, one, a solar project owned by uh, Agri Solar Co-op. Um, so, you know, we've definitely been able to get some political attention, but certainly we need, we do need to keep, uh, keep on the government's uh, radar um, to ensure that we keep traction. Uh, and I will talk about that when we get into the recommendations. And then just, I oh, want to just acknowledge, I mean, a project like this, it is a, certainly a collective effort. I uh, just want to acknowledge various individuals and organizations um, and also funders that helped make this project possible. So uh, in particular, Brad Kundiv from Green Living Communications, who did uh, provide a lot of support in terms of the research and the writing, uh, and then a number of people on the Trek team, uh, and also SolarShare. I want to just uh, do a so shout out to SolarShare and the, the staff that helped dig up the numbers that were used in the analysis. And then finally, the People Power Planet Project, um, which is funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, provided financial support of, uh, of aspects of this project. So <clears throat> thanks uh, to all of those groups and individuals for, for making this project possible. So moving on to the context, uh, Ontario is at a turning point. Uh, we are... Uh, the province is about to undergo another long-term energy plan. Uh, the previous plan committed the province to uh, continuing the supply of electricity from nuclear power at 50 to 60 percent levels. Um, there is so far no indication that the government is planning to back off from that level of target. Um, they have already begun to make commitments in terms of nuclear refurbishments. Uh, as well as extending the life of certain very uh, aging reactors. And so this is really a concern for us in both the renewable energy sector more broadly, but within community power, because we are at a point where the need for, if we continue to maintain the nuclear fleet, then the need for new renewables uh, is seriously curtailed. Uh, and we will we all ultimately have reached our renewable energy targets um, that were set in the last long-term energy plan, and we could essentially see uh, not much further action uh, in terms of renewables or community power. And this at a time, I guess, when renewable energy technology is evolving incredibly quickly, and I'll get a little bit into that, you know, certainly from a pricing perspective, but also in terms of just the evolution of the technology and uh, and its capabilities and so we're it's, we're at a very interesting time in this province where on the one hand you know the energy innovations that are happening around us um, are really quite astonishing and we're in a very good position to take advantage of those but at the same time we have a government that's very committed to uh, a, a technology that ultimately you know hasn't really 
uh, demonstrated to be nimble or uh, low cost. And so that is essentially the context in which we're working. Um, there are also some implications, potential implications for uh, for, the, for carbon emissions if we go that route. Uh, and so just to show potentially what would happen if we had to, if we were not going to be pursuing renewables and building out the gas plants, then our, uh, our in the short term, our, our carbon emissions would increase as a result. And this, as I mentioned, at a time when the cost of wind and solar in particular is coming down dramatically. And again, you can see the different, uh, just see that impact that uh, the different technologies, uh, sorry, you can see the, the comparison of uh, the cost of wind versus the best case for Darlington. Um, so Dar Darlington is one of our nuclear power plants. Um, and again, these numbers uh, do not include things like stranded debt, waste management, or decommissioning. So um, whereas on the wind side, the companies are certainly responsible for decommissioning. Um, so these numbers aren't entirely co comparable um, and also just the long lead time and, and the, the poor experience we've had in Ontario with uh, project nuclear projects being built on time and on budget. So again, these are sort of hopeful numbers, I would say. Uh, and then similarly on the uh, just the cost of renewables, you can see just, you know, that price point coming down in terms of utility scale solar and wind. And uh, I guess the other, you know, really big learning that we've seen in Ontario as we've pursued uh, any number of infrastructure projects, but certainly on the energy side, is that uh, the best way to a low carbon economy is to include communities and individuals. Um, that these, these, this issue is, uh, needs to be tackled as a collective and communities need to be involved. Uh, and community power represents a win-win-win for the province in terms of climate and energy policy, as well as for economic development and community resiliency at a time where, you know, we, we, we do need to build uh, stronger communities. You know, we see, you know, lower revenues available to municipalities, to individual community groups, et cetera. So uh, we see a real opportunity here. You can see a couple of pictures here. These are some First uh, Nations projects. This is uh, the wind turbine is in Chigang First Nation on Manitoulin Island. Um, they've got uh, a wind, three, three uh, turbine wind project. Uh, and then on the right hand side is uh, the Alderville First Nation five megawatt wind uh, solar project. Um, and so, you know, it's important that uh, we're involving all, all communities, that community power is inclusive. Um, and I think the other really big lesson that I wanted to mention is just the experience with the Green Energy Act in Ontario and the opposition to, in particular, to wind projects. But in general, this sort of, you know, sense, uh, often false, that uh, the renewable energy policies are driving up electricity prices. Uh, and so... The more we can involve individuals and communities in the dialogue, but also allow them to participate uh, through community power, the, the, the more likely we are to achieve um, uh, support, uh, but also direct benefits uh, that communities often are you know, desperate, in desperate need of. So as far as we see it, we certainly think that the way forward is through the development of more community-owned power. Um, and just to give, make sure that we all understand uh, the definition that we're using to is using. Uh, community power uh, refers to the direct participation in and ownership of collective benefits from, renew from renewable energy projects. And it's inclusive of different types of uh, owners. So, and it could be in part or in full, but certainly in Ontario, it, right now it is driven by the cooperative sector, in part because of uh, the rules in the province, but we certainly also consider nonprofits and other community groups to be part of the community power mix. Uh, certainly First Nations and Métis communities, as well as municipal entities. Um, all of those, I, we think, should continue to be under the community power umbrella and should continue to be uh, supported in terms of uh, building out projects. Just want to uh, 
do a shout out to these youth from Kettle and Stony Point First Nation who are on a solar installation program and, uh, you know, really speaks to sort of the jobs opportunities as well. Um, and the training opportunities, if the if the sector can can be maintained, and, and that's really a big big part of it. We've had a very cyclical approach to the renewable energy policy in Ontario, which has meant uh, you know great fluctuations in terms of jobs and and industries being able to s sustain themselves. So we definitely need that stability going forward. Um, just a quick diagram on uh, you know the what we see as the community power advantage, and I'll talk a little bit. You know, we will be talking to each of those, um, so I won't get into them in in detail. I'll, I'll actually have a future slide about the benefits of community power, but uh, just a representation of of that. Um, so these are the benefits that we identified in the report. So the environmental attributes, I think it's really important to note that uh, beyond the, the carbon, uh, sorry, the greenhouse gas emission reductions um, that are possible through renewable energy because of its low, very low carbon. Um, and again, we look, that, look at that from a life cycle basis. Um, in, in, within the operational phase, there is no carbon emitted from, uh, from uh, wind and solar projects. Um, there's also much lower extractive impact, so upstream and uh, you know upstream in terms of mineral extraction that we see in the oil and gas sector, as well as in uh, uranium mining. Um, there's l very low downstream impacts as well because most components that go into renewable energy technologies are recyclable, and of course you know the big issue in Ontario is the nuclear waste piece, uh, the lack of uh, long-term storage solution. Uh, and just the, the long timelines at which these uh, this nuclear waste needs to be managed. So, just uh, obviously that that's a broader. These are broader benefits of renewable energy more generally, uh, and community power is, is only a piece of that. So, um, in terms of system benefits, I think it's often not well understood that uh, distributed generation, uh, of which community power certainly is a part, because distributed generation happens closer to the loads. And it involves smaller projects and it, it essentially reduces the investments needed in new transmission and the maintenance costs um, from the system stresses. Um, and you can see that in the slide, uh, sorry, in the chart below that in fact if you consider the transmission costs <clears throat> in, in the comparison you can see that it's actually uh, small rooftop, relatively small scale rooftop system is, is starting to compete, um, it, you know, and certainly once you get into that 500 uh, and one megawatt range, um, these are these are system sizes that actually can benefit the system and also the closer you, you're generating power to loads, um, it certainly helps with grid resiliency during extreme events, uh, we've certainly seen our fair share of those kind of uh, impacts, excuse me, in Ontario in terms of, uh, you know, ice storms and, uh, and other uh, system breakdowns. Um, on the community side, uh, community building uh, is certainly a benefit. Uh, I think one of the pieces that's really interesting is that uh, community power projects are often a gateway for other both climate actions but also other energy projects and what we're seeing um, you know we're seeing this amongst the co-ops in Ontario we've certainly seen this in, in Germany which is a leader in community power uh, and we're seeing it amongst First Nations communities where individuals and groups start to get involved in energy projects they begin to build capacity and as they build that capacity they are uh, you know, in a much better position to take on new projects. In fact, there's often, uh, you know, an eagerness to build on the capacity that's there and to continue to engage either co-op members or community members uh, in different ways, as well as, of course, um, you know, reaping the benefits of those projects. Um, so I think that's really maybe a little lesser understood uh, benefit of community power is this capacity building and this sort of deeper action that results. Um, it's also important from a social license perspective. So as uh, individuals and communities get involved uh, in energy infrastructure, they move from being NIMBYs, not in my backyard, to the YIMBYs, which are the yes in my backyard. 
people, uh, and that's only natural, is that if you're part of a project uh, and you're reaping some of the benefits, especially the economic benefits, then you're going to have be more open. But I think the other piece is the control aspect. When individuals and groups are part of a project where they actually have some say, um, you know, it's going to result in a better project overall and therefore more acceptance. Uh, and finally, I think community power is important for creating a level fi playing field in an industry that's essentially been, ex you know, in really shut out communities and, and, uh, and smaller actors overall. It's, you know, it has been dominated by large centralized players, uh, government monopolies, uh, private monopolies, and community power is a way, you know, renewables again, the technology lends itself to um, that, that distribution of our community power and the policies that support it are specifically uh, enable that uh, leveling playing field. And then uh, the economic drivers, and I'll let uh, Brett get into the numbers, but uh, community investment results in dollars that are invest reinvested locally. So again, that's just general rule of thumb, uh, you know, and a trend that we see is when communities and individuals, you know, they're gonna spend money uh, close to home. And so that can stimulate the local economy. Certainly, it's an important revenue stream for communities, municipalities, um, landowners, uh, First Nations, other community groups that are, you know, deriving benefit both from, uh, you know, taxes and rents, but also from project revenues. Uh, and again, sort of, a, it's a new opportunity. It's it's the energy sector is one that you know is consistently making. 10 to 15 to 18 percent returns and what we're saying with community powers some of those returns could actually be retained by local communities um, and, and in fact what we're what we're finding is that it, that is in fact what is happening and Brett will get into that um, there is also a job creation and skills development component and we do see you know other studies have shown this that there are more jobs created through community power um, and again that skills development that stays that stays local for future projects. Uh, and then the economic multiplier piece that uh, Brett will talk about. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to share uh, what we decided to do actually um, in collaboration with the Federation of Community Power Co-ops was to understand whether the general public in Ontario was supportive of, uh, you know, and what level of support did they uh, have for community projects and, and I think you know the community power message has tended to possibly be lost in the media mix um, you know with the sort of anti-wind sentiment and there's definitely been a strong media push about pricing of uh, electricity and renewables being a cause of that and so you know as much as we've uh, you know the federation and individual co-ops have tried to raise the awareness about uh, community power, it's hard. It's hard to get our message out um, with the media that you know is very critical and is, is often looking for you know bad news stories. Um, so we uh, decided to do a poll, which we ran at the end of April uh, through an independent polling organization called Ecos Research Associates, and um, we asked. Uh, we had these three questions that we asked them. So. Uh, one was we were trying to understand their support for, uh, you know, what, how important they thought it was that Ontario increase community ownership of renewables in this province. And that first, you know, the first section is just to provide some context. Uh, and so you can see, you know, there's overwhelming support uh, in terms of the very important and somewhat important. So uh, over seven, so a 78 percent, uh, you know, expressed support for Ontario continuing this work. Uh, and I think that's, you know, certainly a very strong result. Uh, in terms of, and then we were curious of what, you know, how those numbers would be impacted from a, you know, by technology. So you know, we had a question about supporting a wind energy project, you know, whether they would be more, more or less supportive. And again, you can see here, they're, the numbers indicate that they would be somewhat more supportive of, uh, of a wind project that's community owned uh, and similar numbers and a bit uh, higher for uh, solar. So, you know, of course, 
you know, I think these are important numbers to show the government that sometimes has this feeling that perhaps they've, you know, we're losing the public relations fight on renewable energy um, and obviously to support that community ownership component. Um, so just to put in context to what's happening in Ontario, and I have a, I have a sort of comparison pie chart here looking at, uh, you know, looking at Ontario compared to Germany, but, um, you know, I wanted to just mention that, you know, certainly the work that Trek has done, and I know a number of co-ops, and, and certainly I think community power in general, uh, you know, are very inspired by the results that Germany has uh, presented uh, in terms of who owns renewable energy in that country. Uh, and so you can see here that almost 50% of all renewable energy generation in, in Germany is owned by citizens and cooperatives. Um, so the citizens are often kind of collectives. Uh, it could be a group of farmers. Uh, it could be ho individual homeowners with solar on their rooftops. So quite a wide range, but also there are over 700 renewable energy cooperatives in Germany um, that have emerged over the last 20 to 25 years um, since, um, since Germany introduced its feed and tariff program. And you can see the others, uh, you know, the other side of the equation are the energy suppliers, um, which would be utilities, often utilities and energy companies, and then institutional and commercial uh, developers. Bike, we don't have exactly the same breakdown in terms of uh, what we've done is looked at, you know, who, which projects are owned uh, fully commercially versus by First Nations and Métis communities versus uh, by communities and municipalities. So this is the breakdown we have. So we've got 87% is fully commercial, 10% uh, of projects are First Nation and Métis owned uh, in full or in part, uh, and then 3% by co-ops and municipalities. So while we are definitely leading in North America uh, in terms of community power in Ontario, uh, we, we're certainly uh, a far cry from what Germany has achieved, but we're also only five years into the process. So I think, you know, it's important to keep that into context. So we certainly believe the potential is huge uh, to expand. You know, we'd like to see renewables energy uh, expanded, uh, sort of the ownership expanded to at least 50% by the community power sector. Um, and, you know, it's entirely doable. It's just a question of policy. Um, there's something else I wanted to say on that, but <laughs> just uh, drawing a blank. I wanted to say a few things. So um, we did, met, you know, we've obviously talked about, uh, and we certainly referenced uh, indigenous uh, renewable energy projects as well as municipalities in the report. We don't really have uh, the best data um, on individual project, uh, you know, project costs and uh, and even ownership patterns. And actually, that was the point I wanted to make with this uh, slide. When we say full or in, full or in part, um, we, we just don't have very good data that's broken down, what, neither by co-op, uh, by municipality, or, or for any of the community power sector to really fully understand, um, you know, the proportion of ownership and also the way that these projects are being uh, organized as, as far as like community control. And you know, then that does vary from one partnership to the next. So that's just the reality that we face is that the numbers are not uh, sometimes as fully available as, as we would like to in, in able to, do, to, to be able to do a proper analysis. However, on the co-op side, uh, you know, it is an area we work in directly uh, and we have, there are certainly co-op members that uh, that have, you know, have access to and, and are willing to share the data. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's what we use for the economic analysis. Um, but, you know, I think the one thing I really like this, this quote here, uh, you know, and it really speaks to the importance of community power. And, and this speaks to co-op members, but it's certainly true uh, for any, any of the renewable, uh, sorry, for any of the community power uh, players is that, uh, you know, essentially communities are investing in the infrastructure in their own communities and they're using the returns to support their local economy. 
Uh, and this is a unique, it's quite a unique situation where you actually have communities raising the money for the projects that are going to serve their needs um, and being able to not only benefit in terms of the system benefits and the and the environmental benefits, but they're also benefiting from the environment, the sort of the economic returns that result from these projects. And I've said it before, but the energy industry makes, you know, at minimum, you know, 10, but usually more in the 15 to 20 percent return range. Um, and we're essentially saying community power is asking for a piece of that. And in that communities are in the best position to know what that money is going to be used for. Uh, and uh, and that's essentially, you know, the, the key argument that we uh, that we put forward. Um, just to, just to sort of do a little shout out for the renewable energy co-op sector, it's seen a massive, uh, quite a significant increase over the last five years. You know, started out with just a handful of co-ops before the Green Energy Act, uh, which was a pivotal, you know, a pivotal policy in North America. Uh, for renewable energy and for community power. Uh, and as much as, you know, there's certainly been criticisms of it, um, the feed-in tariff program that we have in Ontario has certainly been a game changer for community power. Um, and, and it has resulted in, you know, almost a thousand megawatts of community renewable energy uh, in the province. As far as the co-op sector, um, so the renewable energy co-ops um, are managing in terms of their sort of majority ownership about 75 megawatts projects. Um, they've, they've raised more than 84 million in community capital through shares and bonds um, and are developing solar, wind and biogas projects. So, uh, so far we've not, we're not aware of any co-ops that are developing hydro projects. Um, on the First Nations side, there's certainly a lot of quite a few communities involved with with hydro projects as well. Um, again, the co-op sector they have have more than 100 million dollars in assets under management and are paying out more than nine million dollars per year in returns to investors. And that's you know for projects that have been built and uh, and that are earning returns to date. So there's still the portfolio of projects continues to grow. Uh, we just had an announcement on the FIT4. Uh, certainly a number of co-ops have indicated their success in that round. Um, there are still some questions around sort of the economics of those projects given the FIT rates. Um, I'm sorry, I, should, I keep using the word FIT, but FIT stands for Feed and Tariff Program, and it's essentially uh, the policy in Ontario that uh, allows groups to... Um, it defines the price at which uh, a project will be uh, will be given a contract. There are other criteria, of course, that d developers need to meet before their projects will be accepted. But uh, the price point is a is a really important one, and there are other provisions in the feed and tariff program that have been instrumental for allowing communities to uh, and, and commu different community groups to participate. Uh, Lastly, uh, there are more, more than 7,000 people across Ontario that are members of renewable energy co-ops. And again, this number is growing because we're still, this, this sector is still in a, in a growth phase. Um, and we would like to continue to see those, all those numbers increase with, uh, with policies going forward, with supportive policies for this sector. Um, so that's on the co-op side. Uh, amongst the First Nations, uh, there are about 800 mega, 850 megawatts of projects built under FIT uh, and over 30 communities that have, have been involved. Um, we don't have other breakdowns in terms of, it, it's structured very differently with First Nations communities. They don't use the co-op model, it's uh, organized differently. So we don't uh, necessarily have those economic uh, returns, but certainly what we're seeing is that communities are Again, you know, they start off with one, one or two small projects, and as they develop capacity, um, they they get uh, they are able to pursue others, and are you know in some cases are bringing in you know new new revenue streams that they didn't have uh, access to before. So, this is, as a way of uh, sort of wrapping up. Um, you know, we feel that people need to be directly involved in the transition to a low carbon future. 
uh, and involvement in community power creates a dialogue around energy use that leads to additional actions. And so, so I want to emphasize that point just because I think it's it's the piece that often gets lost in this whole discussion of community power benefits. Um, if you're a policymaker and you're trying to understand how to, you know, decarbonize the economy, there's really, you know, few better ways to get people behind a, a process um, than involving them directly in it in a way that actually results in economic returns. It's, you know, money does speak. And, uh, and as I said before, you know, once a community comes together and does, you know, a solar project, they start talking about other projects. They start getting thinking about getting their members involved in home energy efficiency projects, um, or in you know, in some cases, and, and again, we've seen this maybe perhaps a bit more in Germany, where communities are really undertaking quite uh, you know setting out quite ambitious targets for you know 100% renewables in their community within you know two decades, that sort of thing, and it's that kind of you know, that, that level of inspiration and innovation and action that we need to tackle um, the climate crisis uh, in a way that still feels positive and doesn't feel like a draconian uh, approach. Uh, and nor should it be left just to industry and, uh, you know, a top-down approach. So that's, uh, you know, I, can't, I guess I can't emphasize that point enough, um, <laughs> particularly those who are on the call who are, you know, in that policy making area. There's very few other ways that communities get engaged in energy except through, you know, through the community power movement. Um, you know, the one thing to remember is these groups are organizing meetings, uh, you know, often they're, they're organizing events to keep members interested. Um, there's a level of education and energy literacy sort of awareness that gets passed on through that approach that can't really be funded through any other mechanism. So that's a that's a really important point, and, and we do need that energy and, and carbon literacy to grow across Canada. So to wrap up uh, on my presentation, I just wanted to share um, you know a little bit on the policy side. So you know what's really important is the is that community power will not work without, without effective policy. Uh, and this is proven over and over again. Um, it's certainly, you know, Ontario is a prime example of that. We saw it in Nova Scotia that has a community feed-in tariff program. We've seen it in Germany, Denmark, the Netherlands, any number of jurisdictions that uh, have community power have introduced a feed-in tariff program or some kind of community energy contract that recognizes that communities cannot compete with the private sector uh, in terms of energy contracts. And so this notion um, that communities can, can participate in a, in a competitive procurement process uh, is essentially false. Um, they cannot. The only way they can participate in a competitive process is through sort of the you know if if the policy f forces the companies that are bidding to include a community component but again the economics there have shown that often the the deal you know is skewed in favor of the industry um and and that's because you know what's driving the procurement process is, is lowest cost uh and so it's a very hard balance to meet, which is how do you, you know, supporting community power and getting the lowest cost for renewable energy. There's, there's got to be a compromise there. Uh, and the feed-in tariff program represents that compromise. Essentially, it says, you know, it looks at the equation differently and says, how much does a, does a group or community need to earn uh, in order to move projects forward? And then the price is worked out on that basis. Um, and so, you know, I say all that to emphasize the importance in Ontario to maintain the FIT program for qualified community organizations, which includes co-ops, Indigenous nations, and municipalities. Um, there is a risk right now uh, that the FIT 5, which is uh, coming up later this year, will be the last round of the feed and tariff program. There's also the risk that the fit, feed and tariff price has been lowered too dramatically to actually allow community groups to have viable projects. Uh, you know, there is a higher cost to developing community-based projects because of the level of engagement that these groups do and because of the longer lead times um, that are just inherent in, you know, in these actors kind of coming up to speed. 
Um, so that's one really critical point is that we need that FIT program to be maintained. Um, and we also would really encourage the Ontario government to in include a FIT program for wind energy. Um, right now, the only way for community groups to participate in wind is either through micro scale projects or, mi or small scale projects under five kilowatts, which is far too small for a wind project to be viable, um, or to partner with a commercial develop developer on a wind project uh, under the large renewable procurement system that has been introduced. You know, wind has seen you know, the biggest contention across Ontario, and yet there's no mechanism for community groups uh, or very limited mechanisms for the community groups to actually to build, build wind projects. So um, that's our second recommendation. Um, we would also like, sorry, I, I skipped a point there. We'd also like to see the, the cap for FIP projects raised. Um, so right now the minimum size project is five, 500 kilowatts. Um, to help improve the economy of the scale, we, we think projects need to go up to one megawatt. And again, it's, it's just a question of if you're building a project, you know, you've got a lot of fixed costs. Um, and uh, if you can spread those out over, over, over a larger size project, you're, you're more likely to be successful. Um, finally, the fourth point is, uh, this one is specific to co-ops and other um, uh, community projects, uh, sorry, it's specific to the co-op sector because uh, right now um, there are no provincial loan guarantees for co-ops and it's very hard for co-ops to access financing. Um, it, it's quite expensive or they're just not even accepted um, because of because they're not their project sizes are too small. Um, they often don't have enough financial history in terms of running projects and of course they wouldn't because it's a new sector. So we're in this weird space. Um, there are provincial loan guarantees for uh, for indigenous groups as well as for municipalities for renewable energy projects. We'd just like to see that extended to the co-op sector. Uh, and then finally, this is, you know, really we see an opportunity for Ontario to be a leader in, in developing community power in other parts of Canada, in other parts of North America. Uh, you know, we've got the skills uh, and we certainly have a lot of experiences uh, and why not... Uh, you know, why not expand on that and bring that to uh, to other jurisdictions? So that, those are our recommendations. Um, I want to hand it over now to Brett, who we engaged, uh, I guess it was earlier this year, to, to help us with the economic analysis. So... As I've said before, this, this hasn't really been done before in part because we really didn't have, you know, we just didn't have enough experience and, and access to the numbers that would allow us to, to, this, to do this level of analysis. So we thought we'd give it a try um, just to see what would come out. And uh, I think the results, you know, have really been uh, quite favorable. Um, and I'm going to have Brett talk us through his approach uh, and also, and but before I do that, before we hand over the screen, I just want to introduce him. So uh, Brett Dalter is uh, an economist with, uh, with a PhD, specializing in climate and energy policy research. He's uh, pub published his work in various journals. He is also the vice president of research and education for the Canadian Society, Society for Ecological Economics. And his PhD dissertation focused on pathways for greening the Saskatchewan grid. So uh, he's got a lot of experience in, uh, you know, economic modeling and, and the energy sector. And so we're really pleased that uh, he, was, he was able to work with us on this, uh, on the economic uh, impacts component of this project. So I'm going to hand it over to Brett and then we'll, we'll open to questions right at the end because I think it, it sort of lends itself to just uh, for us just to carry on. Over to you, Brett. Hello. That's muted. Thank you. Thanks, Judith, for that uh, introduction. And um, yeah, I've got a presentation here. It's uh, just uh, 10 slides, but I want to walk people through the methodology uh, I used to, uh, to come to these uh, conclusions and give you a sense of the results I found. So, uh, 
quick outline of the presentation. I'll talk about the goal of the research. I'm going to uh, show some numbers of a representative solar project, um, how the numbers break down I want you to look at installation costs into things like inverters and, and racking and uh, administration, things like that. Uh, then I'll outline a sort of quick overview of how I went about doing a, a multiplier analysis to look at how expenditures on community solar projects have these multiplier ripple effects uh, throughout the economy. Uh, I'll then go on to talk a bit about induced effects, uh, which is sort of another extension of this multiplier analysis, and then show you some results. So the goal of, of this work was to calculate the direct and indirect economic impacts of community-owned FIT projects. And so when I, when I say direct impacts, I'm talking about uh, expenditures made on things like the panels, the racking, inverters, installation, the labor for installing the project. Uh, over time, there'll be operation and maintenance costs to, uh, to keep these things running. Uh, sales, marketing, and returns to investors. So all these expenditures that, that have to be outlaid in order to uh, get a project going and to keep it going until it's uh, the end of its life uh, are these direct impacts. Now those direct impacts have a multiplier effect and that's the indirect impact. And so if you buy a racking system for a solar panel, uh, imagine that that might be made of something like aluminum. Uh, so we could trace back uh, the benefits and the economic activity that's occurred throughout the economy in order to create that racking system. So you, to create the racking system, the company had to buy some fabricated aluminum. Uh, that aluminum uh, fabrication company had to buy maybe some raw inputs from an aluminum company. They bought electricity and there's this sort of this ripple, this cascade of of impacts and expenditures that have been made in order to get these components uh, to be available for the project. So if you add all those up, you have this indirect impact. And there's also this induced impact. And uh, that comes when we have wages paid out to laborers, we have uh, returns on investment paid to investors. So this money goes to, goes to people and put, gets put in their pocket. And if they choose to uh, spend it in the local economy, there is uh, another multiplier impact that happens there. So you might spend a dollar in the local economy, uh, but there's these rippling cascade effects and that might mean that you've created $2.50 worth of economic impact. Uh, so that's another added economic impact we can look at on top of the direct and indirect uh, impacts. So to look at the uh, direct impacts, I wanted to first start by showing you uh, some numbers on how the installation costs of a representative solar project might break down. And we got these numbers and worked with uh, folks at Endura Solar to, to give us a sense of how costs are broken down when you invest in a 500 kilowatt solar project or a 100 kilowatt solar project. And you can see uh, that bottom line, the total dollar per watt. So it's cheaper if you go with a 500 kilowatt project, a bigger project, $1.75 uh, versus maybe $3 per watt if you have a 100 kilowatt project. And uh, the, the costs you can see as you go down those two rows, you've got things like mounting, uh, the modules themselves, electrical connections, the inverters, also labor on installation, uh, permitting, engineering to plan this, this out, and business overhead. So what I've done here is tried to show if you take that dollar per watt figure and break it into its components, uh, identifying what those components are. And that's the first step in doing this, this economic analysis. So we get the direct, the direct cost and the direct impact m measured that way, and then we can use that to measure and calculate the indirect impacts. So if we now look at the next step, so we want to take all of these uh, types of expenditures and categorize them. So we've got these North American Industrial Classification System codes, NAICS codes, and so you just, the next step was to match the expenditures to the, the right NAICS category. So mounting fits with this fabricated metallic products ca category, uh, down looking engineering fits with engineering construction. And, and this is important because we, we're going to use it to, to do the 
indirect economic impact calculations. Uh, now, once we put these in these categories, need to get an input output table or a make use table for Ontario. So if for this analysis, I was using the 2011 Ontario make use table. Here's just a little chunk of that, but uh, those of you familiar with economic analysis might have seen this type of table before. Uh, those of you who haven't, it's basically a, a table showing the exchange of goods between sectors. And so if we look at a column like uh, we've got utilities in the, the final column to the right, uh, it's showing that the utility sector had some inputs in order to create the output in that given year for Ontario. And the inputs included uh, $1.4 billion coming from mineral fuels. So that's the utility sector, could be the power sector as part of that, buying mineral fuels in order to uh, to operate things like, at that time, uh, coal before it was phased out. So we use this, uh, this table as the, the basis for the analysis to try to get a sense of what, what purchases need to be made in the economy in order to uh, produce a given product. So whether it's uh, utilities buying fuel, agriculture buying inputs, in our case it's uh, the solar industry buying the, the racking, the inverters, the engineering services. Now just a quick, I won't, won't bore you with this too much, but the, I used this information in a Leontief analysis, it's an analysis that was created by this economist Vasily Leontief. Uh, there's a bit of matrix algebra there in the top right. What, what it shows us is on the, the left hand side that x vector total, that is total output, so total output equals the z matrix is the intermediate inputs, these are the inputs required in order to make product plus final demand for final finished goods. With that information, the input output table gives us that information. Uh, we can then do some matrix algebra, rearrange to create this Leontief matrix that becomes this uh, key to the multiplier analysis. So this identity matrix minus A inverted Leontief matrix. And what that does for us is it relates the direct expenditures related to the solar project, this F vector, to the total output required in the entire economy in order to make those products that were used in the solar project, which is X. So you see this Leontief matrix pre-multiplying the uh, direct expenditures. That's the uh, the key to it there. You get this, this uh, matrix, and when you pre-multiply a given uh, set of expenditures that we found in the been finding the direct expenditures, the result is total op output, which includes the direct expenditures plus indirect economic activity. Uh, now there's this extension to the work where we want to understand the induced impact. So we look at each sector, say X1 is uh, agricultural output required to create a solar project. You might not think you need agricultural output to create a solar project. But down the line of this cascading impact, you might find that, well, uh, in order for construction to occur, construction companies buy restaurant meals. In order for restaurant meals to be created, restaurant companies buy food from agriculture. So, so all of these impacts are summarized in the, uh, in the results, the, the total output results. And so you might have X1, the agricultural sector, uh, the output required for the solar project, and we want to multiply that by this measure of the labor intensity of the industry. So try to understand how much of that cost is going to be wages. And do the same for value added or profit. So try to understand how much of the expenditure on agriculture or engineering construction is paid out as wages for labor or as profit to uh, investors. And again, that money is then used to do the induced analysis. So just to summarize then, get this data on a representative solar project, categorize the expenditures by NAICS code, create the multiplier, the Leontief multiplier using the make use tables for Ontario. Then we want to pre-multiply the solar project expenditures by the Leontief to get these total, uh, this measure of total impact, which is the direct and indirect impact total. Uh, to do the extension with the induced uh, impacts, we need to understand how much of the total output was paid to labor or paid to 
uh, investors. So we calculate intensities and uh, calculate how much of that total output was paid to labor or as profit. Uh, then we can calculate the induced impact from that by uh, a simple multiplying total wages by the multiplier impact of spending a dollar in the, the economy on a, on a typical bundle of consumer goods. So there's a few steps there and uh, when we get through those, those steps we get some results and here's a, a summary of the key results of the analysis. You can see there's uh, three projects listed here Project A, Project B, Project C. Uh, so what I've tried to do is just show the the sensitivity of results to to different uh, different assumptions that could be made in the analysis. Uh, you can see they're all assumed to be the same size, about 300 kilowatts. Uh, they generate the same amount of electricity. They're paid at a fit rate that's uh, that's the same. Corresponds to uh, the fit rate from 2012 and something close to the weighted average of of feed and tariff uh, rates paid to the solar share projects. Uh, but the, the assumptions that are important here, you look at this this first section, uh, you can see project A doesn't involve local ownership financing developer, doesn't have local uh, content in the form of inverters or modules, uh, whereas you get to project C and, and all of those things are local. And the results down at the bottom are really what we want to see is, well, for every dollar that's spent through the FIT program supporting a project like a solar share project, we want to understand how much of economic impact does that have in the Ontario economy. And so project A, if you don't have a lot of this local ownership or local inverters and modules, you still get a, a an impact greater than that fee expenditure. So you get for every dollar paid through the feed-in tariff program, a dollar forty in economic impact to Ontario. Uh, Project B has local ownership, local financing, local developer, but not the locally produced inverters and modules. And it's a sort of a two-to-one ratio there. For every dollar spent on a FIT contract, two dollars of economic impact uh, circulates then around in the Ontario economy. Now the bigger impact happens when you get to 100% uh, domestic ownership and this domestic content for inverters and modules. You can get up to about 2.5 times uh, the economic impact as what was put in in terms of the feed-in tariff uh, revenue paid to to the developers. So different arrangements, different financing arrangements, different uh, content in terms of local domestic content have different implications for the economic impacts of a project in Ontario, uh, but as, as Judith was saying, when you're building these community projects, you are getting this local ownership, uh, likely a local developer, solar share works with local developers, and more often than not, you'll, you'll get these local inverters and modules. You get them more often than you would in a project made by a, a big private developer. So you, you'd see in a community solar type of a model, uh, something more like Project C or maybe Project B than uh, Project A. And so those are the results we really wanted to, to highlight uh, in this report and wanted to uh, to have a bit of a calculation of, of how much economic activity, how much impact is made uh, by these community solar projects. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I will just uh, send this program back over to uh, Judith. Unmuted. Oh. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much, Brett. Um, that's really obviously a very thorough job. Um, and, you know, I don't know that we all need to understand the ins and outs of how these things work, but it is helpful, I think, to understand in general um, what goes into these economic analyses. And, you know, these, this, this method is not unlike what is reported on in, you know, the media on other, you know, sector impact. So uh, I think there's a useful education there. Um, but certainly for us, you know, what's interesting is uh, is just to be able to show those concrete numbers and, and talk in the talk in the language and the terminology that 
you know, the mainstream talks about. Um, up on my screen, I wanted to just show you is uh, the Trek website, and I'm, I will open up after this, I will open up to uh, the discussion. But uh, I just wanted to encourage everybody to, you know, to if, you know, if you're feeling comfortable, what we really want to do is raise the awareness about community power in general. Um, you know, this report is a, is a useful way of doing that. What we created here um, on the Trek website uh, is obviously a, a link to the report itself. We have an executive summary, so you can share that with, uh, with friends and uh, colleagues. But we also have this take action section um, where we're really encouraging those of you, you know, in Ontario, for those of you who aren't in Ontario but want to influence Ontario policy, uh, we certainly uh, support that as well. Uh, there's just a letter that you can send to the energy minister, the premier, and your local MPP. Um, you do obviously have to look up your local MPP. Uh, so if you click on that button, it just takes you to a standard letter. Um, it's not showing up right now, but uh, that is what will happen. Uh, so there's a language there that you can use. You can cut and paste it into your browser, or there's another link afterwards that will allow you just uh, to open it up in your uh, webmail. Um, the Learn More, we're on that right now, so you're already participating. Thank you for that. Uh, and then we do have some social media memes that you can share, uh, you know, through your Facebook and Instagram, so uh, or or Twitter. So. Please, uh, you know, if you feel compelled with the, the story we're telling, we would love for you to help us spread the word and uh, get more people aware of uh, the impacts and uh, benefits of community power. So that, uh, that essentially wraps up the presentation portion of our, uh, of our time together. Um, whoops. So we are moving on to the discussion period. And I'm going to hand it over to Daria just to, again, share with us the protocol, just so that we're using the technology efficiently. Thank you, Judy. Uh, so right before I, I, I start, I want to note that this session is actually being recorded, and it's going to be shared with all of, the, all, of the, all of you, all of the attendees, and also with the potential of being uploaded on, on YouTube and on our website. Uh, so if you have any reservations about that, please let me know in the, in the questions box in the, under the questions tab. Um, and uh, so this is just a heads up. Uh, so technically, uh, if you want to ask a question or wish to speak, please raise your hand. Again, it's on the left hand panel uh, on your control panel. Um, and please try and keep your comments and questions to one minute. We want to be... Uh, as inclusive as, as possible and get as many people as involved as possible. And again, same thing as I as I outlined in the beginning, please use the chat tab for, for comments and questions related to the research. Uh, those will be saved. And if we cannot address it now, we will address it after the webinar. And again, if you have any if you're facing any technical questions, please use the questions tab. After you raise your hand, I'm gonna be able to see it from my end. And I'm going to give the floor to you and unmute you, uh, uh, so you don't you don't have to worry about uh, looking around to unmute yourself and stuff like that. Uh, and with that, uh, we'd like to open the floor to to questions and comments. So please raise your hand if you wish to speak. Yes, you have two options. You can raise your hand and speak, or you can also put uh, your comments and questions in the chat tab, uh, depending on. All right, I see, uh, I see a hand by Gideon Foreman, and Gideon, I'm, I'm muting you, and the floor is yours. Go ahead. So can you hear me okay now? Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. So wonderful presentation. Thanks, Judy, and thanks, Brett. Um, I'm just wondering, is there a role for um, some direct government relations work here where um, those of us in the sector, NGOs and co-ops themselves, meet with government to, uh, to push government on some of the things that you recommend at the end of the report? Uh, maintaining the fit for community orgs and raising the capacity cap for fit projects to one megawatt, etc. Is there a role for some direct meetings with government to try to bring these messages home? Uh, yeah, thanks, Gideon. Absolutely. Um, so the next step, you know, in some ways, this report was motivated also by wanting to have, you know, really strong argument to go to government with. 
So our intention all along was to uh, roll out a government relations strategy from this report. And so uh, that that is the plan through the summer. Of course, we have a new energy minister in Ontario, so we're just giving him and his team a little bit of time to get settled in, uh, but we intend to meet with him. We have already met with Minister Murray, who's the climate, uh, and I'm climate change and environment minister, uh, to share okay. some of the results. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the more voices that are collective and uniform and united, the messaging, the better chance we have. Um, so certainly, I know Gideon, you're with the David Suzuki Foundation. There are other right. angles out there that uh, you know would like to join us in getting the word out. Uh, you know, part of it is the letter writing campaign and having the government hear from you know the general public. But of course, what we also need to do is get those meetings uh, and and get this get the results and the recommendations in front of the right people. So that that will be part of our our effort through the summer. Great. Okay. Well, we'd like to be David Suzuki Foundation. We'd like to be a part of that, Judith. So we'll, we'll talk offline. But uh, yeah, we, we certainly we certainly support you in this. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Gideon. I'm I'm muting you again. Thanks. Anybody else? If people feel like sharing about you know their own experiences, community power, um, or any studies you've seen done elsewhere, you know certainly all is welcome here. You don't if you don't have questions, you don't have questions. That's absolutely fine. Okay, I see a hand by by Dennis. Dennis, I'm I'm muting you. The floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Uh, uh, how do you respond uh, to? critics who say that their hydro bills are high because of subsidies to renewables, in, in particular focusing on the FIT program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a fair question and we do hear it all the time. Uh, I guess, you know, then I want to give a nod to Environmental Defense, uh, another NGO here in, uh, in Ontario that has looked at the, or commissioned a study actually to look at what are the results. Um, what is the causes of the increase in the electricity prices in Ontario? Uh, and only, I think it's 14%, although I'm going to add Brad Cundiff to jump in here if uh, need be, but only less than, yeah, I think it's around 14% of the increase on, in our bills over the last few years are attributable to the feed and tariff program. Uh, most of the increase in our electricity bills are actually due to um, the uh, just the infrastructure investments that have had to be made in the province. So for a good 20 years, uh, this province has really not invested in modernizing the grid. And uh, those invest, you know, it just came down to a crunch time. So those increases are largely due to factors other than renewable energy. The other response I always uh, give when I hear people call the feed-in tariff program a subsidy uh, is really just to you know, it's really a, to clarify that electricity generation has always been developed through this kind of mechanism where there is whoever is developing the power generation needs to know that they're making a, a certain return on investment. Uh, and I referenced this before, you know, that number is often in the 15 to 20 percent range. Um, you know, it can go down to 10 percent. But that's how these projects get built. Nobody will do an investment uh, without a return. There's risks involved. Um, there's just costs involved that need to be covered. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I always object to people calling the feed-in tariff program a subsidy. It is a program that recognizes that this is how new generation gets built. Um, nuclear power comes in, you know, telling the government what its cost is and the government you know and, and that's the price um there are those mechanisms with the competitive procurement process that you know there is often the belief that will drive down the cost per kilowatt hour and when the contracts come in it often appears that that will happen what we have found though in many jurisdictions is a lot of those projects don't get built because the competitive process is driving the price down too far but the developers can't build their project so these are, I'm getting into obviously, you know, power pricing and, and sort of some nuances in, in sort of how this industry works. But that, you know, in short, the answer to the bill question 
is that the electricity price increases we've seen in Ontario are only in, in small part attributable to the renewable energy generation that we've added. And I guess if you consider at the same time, you know, the shutting down of coal plants that have been possible and the billions of dollars in health costs that have been saved as a result of that action, you know, now, you know, when you're struggling with paying your bill, that probably doesn't help you all that much. And, you know, I, I do want to also just acknowledge that. I know that there are certainly a large number of uh, individuals and families in Ontario that do do, do struggle with uh, with their bills. And I do think there's there have to be other mechanisms to address that. Uh, and again, I think it's it's a whole other area of energy policy around energy poverty that isn't well managed and, and talked about in this province. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Hello. Hello. I could just add to that, Judith. This is this is Brad, kind of uh, from Green Living Communications. Um, I think we do have to acknowledge that it's very easy for the public to get confused about this. But at least, uh, on the face of it, that when you're paying, you know, 50 cents per kilowatt, my power prices are going up. What people miss is the second part of the equation, which is the rather as opposed to 10 times 10,000 uh, for nuclear or gas, perhaps. Uh, and so people, you know, generally they just sort of go to the logic of, well, it's a high price, that must be the problem. So sort of getting people to walk through that math a bit with you, nobody likes math, but sort of saying to them, what, what results in the bigger number, 2 times 50 or 10 times 10,000? The second part of it is is that you know the, the whole FIT program and the Green Energy Act was about much more than just procuring green energy. It was about kickstarting a new industry in a province that had lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs due to a global recession and a high dollar. Um, and it has been quite successful at that, as our colleagues at Environmental Defense have outlined in some of their reporting. Uh, so it's a matter of reminding folks about that, too, that this was a dual purpose. It was about starting the transition to low-carbon energy, but it was also about creating a new industry here. And despite international trade rulings that have kind of cut into that advantage, there still is quite a substantial renewable energy industry in Ontario, manufacturing everything from wind turbine towers to solar panels. And I guess the third point is to point out to people the degree to which the FIT program is, is increasingly acting as a bit of a, of a, almost a transfer mechanism between governments. So, you know, the federal government has the most taxing power, the provincial government has the next most taxing power, and the municipal governments have the least taxing power. And the provincial government is essentially, in some ways, using the FIT program to steer money to the community. For instance, the Toronto District School Board now has solar panels on over 300 schools. The revenues it is earning from that are paying for its roof repairs that it has no money to pay for in any other way. So otherwise, municipal taxpayers are going to have to dig into their pockets to pay for those roofs. So the FIT program in, in the last few rounds, uh, particularly from FIT 3 onwards, has heavily uh, favored community, and I use the term community broadly, uh, energy projects, uh, everything from school boards to municipalities to co-ops, uh, to develop these projects locally and to flow money back into the local communities. So yes, it's on the face of it, it's very persuasive that the fit rates seem awfully high compared to what I'm paying per kilowatt hour, but relative to the benefits out the other end, the rates aren't that high and the benefits are, as Brett outlined, quite substantial. Right. Thank you. Um, see a hand by Wayne Digby. Uh, Wayne, actually I'm having a technical issue. Can you unmute yourself, please? Oh, there we go. Go ahead, Wayne. The floor is yours. Yeah, I'm uh, with the uh, Manitoba Sustainable Energy Association, 
and um, we're looking at working with uh, community economic development uh, people in the province to promote uh, community energy, community power projects. And I just uh, wondered what uh, your experience has been in working with that group of people in Ontario, how you do it, what type of training you provide, etc. Oh, well, thanks for calling in and uh, joining us. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I guess we were things sort of evolved a little bit differently here, in that it, we we almost you know were running to catch up with the policy once it was introduced. So, I mean, not to suggest that you know there wasn't quite some effort amongst uh, the environmental NGOs and, and different coalition. Uh, groups uh, in Ontario to help bring in the Green Energy Act. But because we had the policy, you know, the policy was quite favorable um, off the top, uh, we didn't really build a coalition beyond so the co-op sector um, and the ENGO sector right off the top. It's really now more recently that we've started talking to economic development groups more specifically. So I, I just think the evolution is different. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right in that approach is that, um, you know, that this this policy does, you know, you know, I think what I was trying to illustrate is, you know, it's rare, I think, in government policy to find something that has sort of these, you know, multifaceted benefits um, that can be addressed through a single policy. Um, and so the more you can bring people under, you know, that umbrella of community power and you've got different arguments, whether that is, you know, the economics, you know, the resiliency, the, the climate action, the jobs, uh, you know, the, obviously the environmental impacts, you know, it, it, it's, it's a unique sector in that sense, I feel, or it has been my experience of it. I, it could just be my limited experience of other sectors, um, having worked in, the, in energy for so long. But... Um, yeah, so I, I don't have sort of a, you know, a strategic comment on how we did it. What I'm see, seeing is that the economic development folks are coming to us now saying, oh yeah, we, you know, we really like, you know, we really get it. We, we get that economic impact piece and how can we, you know, how, how can we support this? In Ontario, it's been more the alignment with the cooperative association. Um, that's been strong from the beginning. And uh, even I would say, you know, that building those alliances between the co-op sector and, and the indigenous sector and even the municipal sector, that is only just starting to happen now. And I think it's partially because we were all, you know, thrown into the policy. There was a lot of, you know, it was a steep learning curve for everybody. There wasn't a lot of time to sort of look around and, you know, and have conversations. There was a lot of sort of getting, you know, trying to get projects well, getting contracts applications in and then getting projects built. And now we're at that point, we, you know, we have a little bit more breathing room and we're starting to say, okay, you know, how do we, you know, how do we keep this going and how do we do that through a collective effort? Um, so I, ho I hope that answers your question. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. I'm muting you again. Um, anybody else? I don't, I don't see any hands um, for now. Yeah, we're at uh, 221, so we're certainly happy to keep going for another nine minutes. Uh, if, if anybody has any other comments, questions. But uh, yeah, we don't need to, if uh, people feel like they've uh, gotten all they need out of this process, then uh, we can certainly wrap up early. Uh, Perhaps we'll ask one last time, uh, give you 10 seconds. Sure. Okay, well thank you so much for everybody's participation, for taking time out of your day to participate in this. Um, we're certainly excited uh, that there is so much interest, and uh, I want to thank uh, Brett Dolter very much for his uh, obviously his hard work on the economic analysis and, and for the presentation, and to Daria Turan for getting this uh, event organized and uh, helping it go smoothly, and uh, to you know to the entire Trek team, 
uh, into the Federation of Community Power Co-ops here in Ontario. Um, and, and everybody that helped, you know, contribute to the that contribute to the report. You know, it's you'll you'll see there's various quotes in there. There's uh, you know different references to different groups. Um, so I just uh, you know it, it's been a huge effort to get to where we are to about a thousand megawatts of community power in Ontario. It's it's a great start, and we really would like to see that just uh, blossom into you know um, many more many more projects uh, and many more benefits that we we know are possible. So uh, on behalf of everybody on the team, thank you very much. And uh, we will, we wish you a happy summer and we hope that you can help spread the message about community power. And feel free to get in touch if you, you know, if you're working on any projects in your own jurisdictions, I'm always happy to try and give some uh, thoughts and ideas on how to think, move things forward. Thank you. Goodbye everyone.